in the previous class we have been discussing the response of linear time invariant systems. In fact, we took simple second order systems in order to illustrate the response. The basic uh, interesting fact about uh, the analysis of linear time invariant system is that there is the time response can be written down in terms of well known functions and because of that one can infer the stability and the dynamical properties fairly easily. So, uh, the main uh, important result which we uh, got last time was that the response of a linear system is a sum of individual patterns or individual modes of response. So, to make that a bit more uh, precise, uh, let us take a simple linear time invariant system without any input, x is a vector, a is a matrix. Then the response of the system is given by It is in fact a summation of several modes. Of course, this particular response can be written down in case you have got uh, the A matrix diagonalizable, which we will just uh, kind of try to understand once more. If A is diagonalizable by a linear transformation of the variables x, in that case one should be able to write the response in this form. It is a summation of various patterns or modes. Lambda i's are the eigenvalues. They are pr a property of the matrix A itself. In fact, determinant of lambda into an identity matrix minus A is equal to 0 yields uh, characteristic equations whose solutions in fact uh, are the eigenvalues of the matrix A. A remember is of course, an n cross n matrix. This particular characteristic equation will yield us a polynomial of order n and uh, in general they can uh, there will be of course, n solutions of a nth order polynomial. Now, uh, importantly this p i are the columns of the eigenvector matrix. So, if you uh, recall what we did in the previous class, we were talking of a particular transformation x is equal to p y and a p such that p inverse a p yields a diagonal matrix. The columns of P are the right eigenvectors P of course, it has to be invertible and in uh, uh, we discussed this last time in case A is diagonalizable that is A has in fact, uh, n distinct eigenvalues in that case it is possible to find the columns of P such that P is invertible. So, in fact, A is diagonalizable provided we get a P which is non singular, which also means that the columns of P should be linearly independent. In fact, if you have got n distinct eigenvalues, A is diagonalizable. And as I mentioned some time back, if A is diagonalizable, you can write the response in this form. The q i here, the q i transpose is a row matrix, is a row vector rather, which is in fact the rows of p inverse, the eigenvector matrix inverse, the rows of it are q i. So, the main, uh, this was the main result which we saw last time. And uh, the most important uh, issue which we uh, discussed was depending on the components of P i, the components of P i, you can observe or measure the relative observability of 
the pattern e raised to lambda i t in the various states. So, that is an important point which we discussed in the previous class. Also, we saw that depending on the value of the initial conditions, a mode could be excited, weakly excited or not excited at all. So, this was the interpretation we could give to the layer to the uh, the eigenvectors. In fact, an important point uh, which uh, slipped my mind uh, last time was that q i in fact also satisfies this relationship. So, q i is also known as the left eigenvector. So, q i are not only the rows of p inverse, but they also satisfy this particular property. Now, what happens if uh, the matrix is not diagonalizable? So, if the matrix A is not diagonalizable, in fact, if A has distinct eigenvalues, it is always diagonalizable, but if A has non distinct eigenvalues, then A may not be diagonalizable. So, that is an important point which you should know. So, for example, the matrix A which is 1 in fact is non diagonalizable if you take out its eigenvalues which is very difficult to uh, which is not very difficult to find out the eigenvalues are determinant lambda i the identity matrix minus a is equal to 0 the eigenvalues are 1 and 1. So, these are non distinct and this particular matrix is non diagonalizable you cannot diagonalize this matrix because you cannot get you know p 1 and p 2 which satisfies a p 1 is equal to p 1 and a p 2 is equal to p 2. p 1 and p 2 it will turn out to be will be always in the same direction that is p 1 will be alpha p 2 alpha is any arbitrary constant. So, what you will find out is that because of this you will not get you will not be able to construct a p with p 1 and p 2 as its columns so that you can diagonalize this matrix. So, you cannot get the p to diagonalize the matrix. So, that is why this particular system is not diagonalizable. Now, uh, of course, there are examples in which you do have repeated uh, non distinct eigenvalues, but still you can diagonalize it. For example, this particular matrix is a kind of a uh, academic example. This is a matrix which is diagonalizable. In fact, it is already diagonal. It also has got repeated eigenvalues, but obviously, this is a diagonalizable matrix, it is a diagonal matrix in fact. So, there are exceptions. So, just remember that the correct statement is if A has non distinct eigenvalues, A may or may not be diagonalizable. So, that is the important point which you should note. Now, uh, one uh, aspect which we should uh, discuss is if it is non diagonalizable, what is the response? For example, Suppose, I have a matrix which it turns out that the eigenvalues are lambda, lambda, lambda 1, uh, lambda 3 and lambda 4. There are 4 eigenvalues of a 4 by 4 matrix A suppose. This is non distinct, uh, they are uh, you know eigenvalues are repeated. So, A may or may not be diagonal, let us assume that it is not diagonalizable. In that case, I will just uh, without really proving it, uh, we can show that you can find a p matrix which does not get you to a diagonal matrix, but gets you to a near diagonal matrix which is also called a Jordan matrix. So, you have got lambda 1 0 lambda 0 0 0 0. So, if a matrix is not diagonalizable and has as, as eigenvalues as shown we can actually get it in this form. This is called a Jordan form. Now, this uh, is a simplified matrix, uh, this is a simplified kind of transformed uh, matrix, which of course, one can get the time response quite easily. So, uh, please recall that in case you have a system in which A is diagonalizable,
your response is x of t is equal to p e raised to diagonal matrix into p inverse into x of 0, but in case your system is not diagonal uh, is not diagonalizable then the response can be different. Remember here e raised to this diagonal matrix is in fact this is a diagonal matrix like this. So, if your matrix is diagonalizable your response is as shown here. Of course, the expanded form of this response is in fact, what I discussed some time back that is this, this is the expanded form. If your matrix is not diagonalizable, then your response x of t is equal to p e raise to j t p inverse where j is a raise to lambda t t e raise to lambda t this is taking the example which we discussed some just a while ago that is you have got e raise to j t is this. So, remember that in case you do get non distinct eigenvalues, you can still write down the response, but remember now you are getting the response in terms of not only exponential functions, but you have got time coming here t into e raise these kind of terms will come into your response. So, that is the important difference. Uh, you can of course, have uh, more than two repeated eigenvalues, uh, but uh, we will not go further and uh, deeper normally in our power system analysis one will not come across situations there will be there will be more than uh, you know uh, you know you have uh, three eigenvalues which are non distinct and it's not diagonalizable that's very a uh, uh, fairly rare situation in most in most cases which we will consider you will have all eigenvalues distinct so it's important to remember this now, one uh, important point which you uh, should note is that in this particular course, we do require you to understand the response of linear systems. Of course, it is not practicable in this course to give you a full exposition of everything about linear system theory. So, it is good if you refer to some control systems, linear control systems books for more details about the response of linear time invariant systems. So, for example, you can look at the book by Ogata, State Space Analysis of Control Systems, this is 1967. Of course, there are many other good books. So, I, this is just an example. So, this is an example of a book you could uh, refer to. Now, of course, uh, an uh, associate problem which we will come across is what happens when you have got a system which is forced that is uh, it has got an input. So, if you have got a system x dot is equal to a x plus b u okay, and you are not observing all states, but you are observing one output which is a which is basically a combination of the states. So, such a uh, kind of a sy system uh, has got both an input and an output. So, I will just write it down x dot is equal to a x. Let us assume there is only one input u and you are also observing a certain variable you know which could be a combination of the states c is a c is a vector, x is our state. So, you could have a combination of states as a multiplication of a row with a column. We will assume u and y are scalars. So, this is a single input, single output system. In such a case, uh, what is the response of x? We had uh, written down the response when a was a scalar. 
okay, some in some lectures uh, before. The response of the system when A is a coupled matrix is x of t is equal to E raised to a t x of 0 plus 0 to t E raised to a t minus tau b u could be a function of time. In the convolution integral uh, d t is should actually be d tau. Okay. So, there is this minor error here y is simply c of x t y of t plus d of u u of t. So, this is our response of the system. Remember e raise to a t is a shorthand for p e raise to p inverse. We have already discussed what this is in case it is diagonalizable or it is equal to p e raise to j t p inverse if it is non diagonalizable. This is the Jordan form matrix. So, just remember this formula which you have for the forced response. So, it is quite easy to take out the forced response as well, it is not too difficult, especially if you are a simple inputs like uh, sinusoidal inputs or step inputs. This ex, uh, trying to evaluate this is not a really a major problem. Now, uh, before we uh, we will just write this particular equation and this particular equation in full form. So, if I expand this, let us assume that A is diagonal and I expand this, what you will get is y of t is equal to c times i is equal to 1 to n, this is the response of x of t. plus of course, other terms. If input u is, if the input u is 0, these other terms are 0. One interesting point here uh, is uh, that if C p i is equal to 0, then that part the mode or the pattern will not be visible in y t. So, if C is such that C p i is equal to 0, it is not visible. Although it may be visible uh, in the states, but it still may not be visible in y. So, y is actually a combination of states. These other terms of course, are dependent on u. So, this is an important uh, point. So, not visible there is a proper uh, technical term called observable. So, if C p i is equal to 0, then the ith mode is not observable in this input output y. Okay. Similarly, since x of t is equal to sigma of i is equal to 1 continue here. So, what we have we can just write this uh, a bit uh, differently. That we can take out p i e raise to lambda i t common and then in the bracket we have got 0 to t this whole thing is summed okay q i uh, you will have e raise to lambda minus lambda i tau q i transpose b u tau d tau. It is a bit messy here, but I have just since the variable which is getting integrated is tau, I have kind of taken out this e raise to lambda i t outside the integral. 
So, what we see one critical point if q i transpose b this is 0 for some i in that case term corresponding to lambda i t in this response is dependent only on initial conditions. If such a situation occurs, we also say that this particular mode i is not controllable by the input u. So, please remember these uh, important concepts. In case q i transpose b is equal to 0, the e raise to lambda i t term in the response of the states is dependent entirely on the initial conditions and cannot be changed by the input u. So, that, that is one important point which you should note. Okay. So, we have uh, through this rather straightforward analysis given you a very intuitive kind of notion of observability and controllability. We shall actually come back to these concepts in a multi machine systems where we shall see that there are many many modes and certain modes are not observable at certain places, certain modes are not controllable by controllers which are located at certain locations. So, this is a very these uh, concepts are pretty important the uh, concept of observability and controllability in uh, linear control systems. Of course, our uh, analysis of the same has been very very intuitive and sketchy. Hopefully, we will uh, revisit these things and uh, it will become clear at that point of time. That will be sometime of course, much later in the course. Now, although we have been doing uh, the analysis of a linear time invariant system, there are a few computational issues which we should worry about because eventually the power systems which we are going to the realistic power systems or systems we are going to study are going to be fairly large. So, one or two simple points and important points which you should uh, bear in mind are that if I want to compute eigenvalues, I had mentioned that one of the ways of doing it is solve this equation determinant lambda i minus a is equal to 0. It turns out that this is not very uh, easy to do if your size of a becomes larger. In fact, uh, if you have got for example, a matrix of size 20 by 20, you will find that it is becomes almost uh, next to impossible to actually solve it by actually computing the characteristic impedance uh, characteristic equation. In fact, computing the characteristic equation, the coefficients of the characteristic equation themselves become pretty uh, tedious. So, uh, there are in fact, iterative methods like power method or the q r method. We will of course, not be discussing all the methods or uh, in fact, we will not really be going into eigenvalue computation when A is a large system. I can recommend that you look at any book on matrix computations where this particular aspect is covered. But remember one small point that whenever you need to compute the eigenvalues of a matrix and if that matrix is large, you have to take recourse to some iterative methods. It is not feasible to do it by actually computing the coefficients of the characteristic equation uh, by actually evaluating this. That would be very, very computationally intensive. Of course, we shall take a bit of the easy way out in this particular course, otherwise we will get our hands will get totally occupied in trying to understand all the computational methods and uh, the theory behind linear systems and so on. We will lose track of what we really wish to do that is understanding a power system. So, uh, from now onwards I will also take help of mathematical software to do the computations. So, one some of the software which can help you to do this which are quite widespread and uh, used often are uh, Scilab. This is of course, freely downloadable software and also MATLAB which is quite popular. So, if you use these uh, one of these two tools or probably any equivalent tools, uh, it should be fairly uh, straightforward to do most of the computer computations which we will do in this particular course. So, uh, rather than uh, spend more time on trying to give you more and more results and mathematical results and so on, let us instead take a more pragmatic view. Let us take a simple system and uh, numerically compute the eigenvalues. We will take a 
slightly larger system we have been always considering second order systems which are uh, the eigen values eigen vectors are easy to compute we will take a slightly more complicated example uh, it is a third order system not really very complicated but uh, we would require some computational help others will become very tedious to do. So, uh, rather than just talk in terms of a you know abstract some random a matrix we will just take a simple engineering example which uh, will bring out not only how the method for getting the response, but will also tell us some interesting ways of interpreting the results you know all the eigenvalue and eigenvector information has to be interpreted correctly. So, let us consider an example there is a voltage source connected in fact, you can look at this as some kind of equivalent of a pulse transformer of course, I have not given very realistic values of uh, a transformer it is a kind of this is a kind of leakage uh, leakage reactance the resistance of the wire you can consider this as a magnetizing react reactance and also this capacitor really denotes the uh, capacitance of the widening. So, this is a kind of a near realistic example it is a model a toy model of a pulse transformer. Uh, I have chosen the values in such a way that uh, it will aid us. So, in that sense I have not given exactly realistic values. If you, re you just look at this particular example without even having to solve it you will notice that this is a very large inductance compared to the leakage which is 10 milli henry this is 100 microfarad and this is 0 0.1 ohm. So, this is a kind of a situation in which there are uh, in fact components which are fairly differing in size they are, they are not of the same size this leakage is much smaller than this and so on. In fact, uh, the main reason why I have given you this example we shall actually pursue this example even further after this class is over uh, is that this particular system has got some certain characteristics. Uh, it is in fact what is known as a stiff system. So, before I tell you what is a stiff system etcetera let us just look at the steady state. In fact, if this particular system has is not excited at all in case it is not excited at all it is easy to see that that is if the voltage here is 0 or I keep this open the equilibrium is when, when what is the equilibrium of this the equilibrium point of this is obtained by setting the rate of change of the states of the system to be 0. So, let us for example, choose the state suppose uh, I L 1 is a state, I L 2 is a state and V C is a state. So, uh, this is the initial conditions of these have to be given if I want to tell you what the response is going to be, but if you for example, if I uh, when is For this particular circuit if, if the input u is 0 that is I connect this to a voltage source which has got voltage 0 in that case it is not very difficult to see that in steady state if d i l 2 by d t is equal to 0 it also means that the voltage here is equal to 0. So, V c will have to be 0. Okay. So, the equilibrium if input voltage is 0, input is 0 is V c is equal to 0, I l 1 is equal to 0 and I l 2 is equal to 0. This is the equilibrium for no input for for input u which is equal to V i is equal to 0. Okay. So, if the input is 0 in that case this is the equilibrium it is not very difficult to find that out we can do it formally that is I l 1 1 by d t is equal to this is 10 is to minus 2 10 milli henry's this is 10 milli henry's this is 0 0.1 ohm. So, you will have if you apply this uh, K V L in this loop you will get is equal to
or in other words L d i by d t plus 0 0.1 into I l 1 plus V c is equal to V 1. So, I have just got things some things on to this side when I applied k V l. So, this is the basic equation this is the second equation and the third equation is of course, 100 microfarad is equal to of course, if V i is equal to 0 that is the input I make if, if the input were to be 0 then the steady state value is obtained by putting all these things equal to 0. So, if V i is equal to 0 this is equal to 0. So, V c also will be equal to 0. If V c is equal to 0 and V i is equal to 0 it means I l 1 is equal to 0. If this is set to 0 then I l 1 is equal to I l 2 which means I l 2 also is 0. So, if V i is equal to 0 then this is the equilibrium condition. This is obtained by setting all the derivatives equal to 0 that is it. So, this is if you do not excite it at all that is or you excite it with a 0 voltage source this is the equilibrium condition for the system. However, if as I have shown here I excite it with a 1 volt source in that case I can write this compactly in this fashion. To save some time, I will omit all the algebra and write this equation. So, for t is equal to 0, this is A and this is B into U. So, this is B into U. So, this is basically our uh, system and uh, this is the system after T greater than 0 and uh, let us assume that at T is equal to 0 the initial conditions are all 0 that is all the, the currents and the voltage are actually 0. So, let us assume at T is equal to 0 the initial conditions. Remember in all linear dynamical systems or all dynamical systems we need to be given some conditions like the initial conditions in order to tell what the future response is going to be. So, let us assume the initial conditions are this is the initial conditions only at time t is equal to 0. So, the response is if this is A and this is B u you will get sorry e raise to a t 0 0 0 this is the initial condition plus 0 to t e raise to a t minus tau into b u tau. So, this is after time equal to 0 after time is equal to 0 this is how it looks like. So, this turns out to be uh, we will cut a long story short this will turn out to be 0 and uh, if you evaluate this I will skip the steps I will just write down the final answer I 3 minus E raise to minus A T sorry into 10 10 0. 
So, I just uh, evaluate this particular matrix this particular this is of course, 0. So, if I actually evaluate this from 0 to t, I will get i 3 minus e raise to a t into 10, 10 and 0. So, which of course, can be written down. We know what e raise to a t of course, is a shorthand for p e raise to lambda 1, lambda 2. Of course, this is a 3 by 2, 3 matrix. So, this is what we get. So, this is our response. Now, of course, the point is what is uh, in fact, uh, we are assuming here of course, it is diagonalizable this needs to be actually checked. So, we need what is lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3 and also we require this matrix P. So, this is what we really require in this particular system. So, this of course, has to be obtained from A. Now, for very simple second order systems, I showed you how you can take out the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. We did a very simple example in the previous class, but if you really want to do an example uh, in which is a third or fourth order matrix, it is used to useful to use some software and here I will show you this computation using the software Scilab. Note down Scilab is freely downloadable, it is available at this point of time at this particular web address www.skylab.org. Okay. So, I will show you this computation on Scilab. So, just keep this in mind what we are doing. If we start up Scilab, this is what you will get. Now, I will not really tell you all about the syntax of using Scilab and so on. What I will try to uh, you know just show you the commands and the syntax is fairly intuitive. So, you should be able to pick it up on your own. So, what I will do here in order to take out the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, I first enter the matrix A. This is nothing but 10, this is the first row, then I enter the second row, this is the syntax of entering a matrix, then you have got the third row. So, this is your A matrix. The eigenvalues and eigenvectors of A can be obtained from a command called spec of A that will give you actually the eigenvalues associated with the system. So, the eigenvalues associated with the system are roughly minus 5 plus a complex number, this is a complex number roughly this one, this is approximate, I have just rounded off. Now, uh, the point is these are the eigenvalues, uh, one important point you are seeing is that you are getting eigenvalues which are not real numbers, they are complex numbers. Even if they are complex numbers, I told you the stability criterion is that real of lambda should be less than 0. So, this is in fact a stable system because the real parts are all less than 0. One important point which you notice here again is that although these are complex number, they seem to appear in complex conjugate pair. In fact, a general result which can be stated is that if A is a real matrix, then its eigenvalues are real and or whenever they are complex, they will appear in complex conjugate pairs. So, you can have real eigenvalues and or complex conjugate pairs. Your final response as I shall show you in some time is in fact quite is going to be real, it is not going to contain imaginary terms at all. Okay. So, uh, please remember that your, your eigenvalues whenever for a real matrix you will get eigenvalues as real and or complex conjugate pairs as you are seeing here. 
One more thing which, which you should notice here, remember we are trying to do a study of interpreting the results as well. This eigenvalue and the magnitude of these eigenvalues are very, very much different. In fact, you will see that this particular eigenvalue is small. In fact, a small eigenmagnitude eigenvalue is associated with slow rates of change. So, you will find that your response will contain one pattern which is relatively slow and one pattern which is corresponding to a high magnitude eigenvalue, the rate of change of that pattern will be fairly fast. So, in fact, a larger eigenvalue uh, is associated with faster rates of change. So, that is one important point which you should note. These of course, eigenvalues are three distinct eigenvalues. So, our response will be a superposition of, of modes. In fact, uh, so we do not have to worry about Jordan form or what happens, uh, how do you actually solve uh, with repeated eigenvalues. This is a luckily we have got a system with uh, three distinct eigenvalues. Now, I mentioned some time ago that your response is this. Now, we also require in order to get the response to find this value p. p is the eigenvector matrix. In fact, there is a command in uh, scilab uh, which allows you to take, take out the, uh, the eigenvector matrix that is p. So, if you do this, p in fact gives you the right eigenvector matrix. In fact, you get the columns 1, 2 and 3. Remember, column 1 itself is complex. Column 1 is complex, column 2 is also complex because they correspond to complex eigenvalues and the column 3 is real. In fact, the column 3 corresponds to the eigenvector associated with the real eigenvalue. In fact, we should not just let this go as it is. One important point you will notice is that the eigenvectors associated with the complex conjugate pairs turn out to be complex conjugate themselves. So, you see that this particular eigen, eigenvector is minus practically 0 and this is almost 0.1 into j, j or i, i is actually square root of 1 that is j. I mean I have been using j, the software here uses i. You will find that the eigenvector component here is the complex conjugate of this. So, this is an important property of real matrices. So, even your uh, eigenvectors turn out to have certain properties. One more interesting point is I will just write this eigenvector matrix. This is the eigenvectors and roughly this is roughly very roughly this is j into point 0.1, this is practically 0, this this term here the second term is practically 0 and the third term is practically 1 roughly. Okay. This is minus j 0 0.1, 0, 1 and this is minus 0 0.7, minus 0 0.7, and 0 0.06. So, please have a look at the screen again, the computer screen. I have just approximated these columns, okay? just rounded it off. I mean uh, uh, rather I should say I approximated it rather than round off. This is practically 1 and this is a very small number here. So, this is how I get p. You can concentrate on the sheet which I am writing on. Uh, you will get a p matrix of this kind. Okay. So, if I numerically evaluate now, I have got lambda 1, lambda 2 and lambda 3, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3 and I also have got p 1, p 2, p 3 and the p matrix. So, I can actually take out p inverse. So, p inverse is take out the inverse of p matrix. So, I just print this out. So, this is the inverse of the p matrix. The columns of this, this is column 1, column 2, column 3. But if you look at the row, that will give you q i the you know q i transpose. Okay. So, I have also computed p inverse in this particular case. Okay. But let us now evaluate the time response of x. This is what I eventually managed, wanted to take out p this and p inverse. Okay. So, if you finally compute 
the response, I will omit the algebra, what you will get is I L 1 of t, I L 2 of t and V c of t is equal to, this is the final response 10 minus 10 e raise to minus 0 0.1 t plus 0 0.1 e raise to minus 5 of t sin of 1005 t and this is 10 minus 10 e raise to minus 0 0.1 of t. Please try to work it out on your own with Scilab. I am just writing down the response directly. This is of course, making certain approximations uh, in the sense I have rounded off certain terms. So, this is your final response. So, your I, I L 2 t is 10 minus 10 and so on. Now, one important point is that lambda 1 and lambda 2, which were in fact a complex conjugate pair here, seem to be after a lot of algebra, seem to be giving you a sinusoidal term here. Remember that things get so arranged because of the fact that uh, eigenvalues appear in complex conjugate pairs, the complex eigenvalues are in complex conjugate pairs you will find that you should be able to make these simplifications and your responses in fact will turn out to be in terms of sines and cosines, there is no complex number in the response eventually, because you will be able to combine all the complex terms appropriately in order to get these terms. Okay? Now, one of the important points uh, after a bit of uh, you know approximating the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, these are the this is the eigenvector and these are the eigenvalues. Okay? One thing you will notice here is that the there is a exponentially decaying component of the response, there is a forced component because of the input which you have given and there is also a component here which is oscillatory in nature, it is a decaying oscillation. Okay. Similarly here, okay. so because of the fact that you have got a complex conjugate pair of eigenvalues, the mode which you get will be oscillatory, there is a oscillatory mode okay? and there is also an exponentially decaying mode. Another important point which you notice is that the oscillatory mode is practically not observable in I L 2, that is a very, very important point. So, what you are finding is that in this particular system for all practical purposes, of course, we did make a, a few rounding off kind of approximations, but for all practical purposes there is no the ob, there is no observability of this oscillatory mode in this I L 2. In steady state, I L 2 turn out to be 0, I L 2 is 0, V c also turns out to be 0. If I put t tending to infinity, V L and I L, uh, v, v, L uh, v c and I L 2 become 0 and I L 1 becomes 10. Does that, uh, if you look at this, if V i is 1 volt, okay, what are the steady state conditions here? In steady state, remember an inductor becomes a short, okay? a capacitor becomes open circuited. So, what you have really is if this is a short, this is open circuit, this is a short, your current through here will be simply 1 divided by 0 0.1 which is 10 amperes. This current here, this particular capacitor here in steady state becomes open circuited. Okay. This inductor here becomes a short circuit. So, what you will find is eventually you will have 10 amperes flowing here and going into this, but the voltage here is equal to 0. Okay. So, the steady state in case you excite the circuit with a non-zero input, okay, 
is going to be that I L 1 and I L 2 are going to be 10 amperes and V C is going to be 0. Okay. So, this is 10 and 10 and this is going to be 0 as T tends to infinity. So, this is an important uh, thing which you should uh, be able to do by setting T tending to infinity you should be able to take out the steady state final that is the final values of these uh, terms. Now, what you really are seeing here in fact, uh, this particular example we do not uh, we would like to interpret the results appropriately, because the eigenvectors are in fact giving you some idea about the observability of modes. If you look at P, which is the right eigenvector, you see that the second state that is I L 2, the component is practically 0, that is why it is not observable. You will not see the oscillatory mode observable in the second state which is I L 2. Okay. Similarly, actually if you see here in V C, you will not see the exponentially dying mode to the same extent as you will see it here. In fact, it is almost 10 times more seen in these two states than it is seen here. So, that is what we really got in the final response. If you focus on the sheet which I have written down here you will find that whereas, the coefficient of this e raise to minus 0.1 t is 10 here, it is only 1 here. So, you will see that relatively uh, you can observe this particular mode more in these currents okay, than in the voltage. Of course, voltage and current are incompatible because the units are slightly different. So, you one should take care in interpreting the results you cannot compare 10 amperes with 1 a volt. So, that is one issue which you should remember. So, what I said was only a, you know kind of giving us some relative feel. Okay. Now, although we have written down the response, it is a good idea to simply plot the response. Uh, we will uh, just plot the response using scilab and uh, you can of course, see how the response looks like, because it is sometimes difficult to picture if you are new to studying uh, dynamical systems, how the response is going to look like. So, if you for example, see what is the response of I L 1 okay? or what is the response of uh, V C. Okay? So, I will just uh, try to uh, you know write down the response. So, let us assume that I will evaluate the response at some time steps. Okay? So, I will I'll try to evaluate the response at the time steps t. So, at discrete time steps, I will evaluate the time response okay, and plot it. So, the time response of course, of I L 1 is given by 10 minus 10 star this is a product to time time plus 0.1 into x component of minus 5 t sin of 1005 times t. So, this is So, I L 1, I have evaluated I L 1, I L 1 is simply this formula which is evaluated out here, I simply evaluated the formula which I had mentioned before. So, what I will do is plot time versus I L 1. So, what you see is this is the waveform of I L 1, it practically if you look at what it contains, it is basically containing mainly this term e raise to minus 0.1 t, 
it is very easy to see this particular term. Remember that e raise to minus 0.1 t has got a time constant of 10 seconds. So, around 4 times that time constant you will find that the system here is settling to its final value. An important point is that you are not able to see much of the oscillatory response. Okay. Let us just look at in contrast V c. V c is nothing but So, I will plot V c. What you see is if this is I L 1, this is what V c is. So, V c of course, has got us this oscillation here. This initial oscillation in fact, is that 1000 t cos of 1000 t which you are seeing here and there is a also a component which is decaying. So, you find that the response of course, is a superposition of the two modes and both modes in this case are fairly visible. So, you see this oscillatory mode in the beginning. Of course, the rate of decay of the oscillatory mode is more e raise to minus 5 t decays faster than e raise to minus 0 0.1 t. So, this is basically the response which you get. Now, if of course, I plot I L 2, I L 2 is simply 10 minus 10 star x 1 star t. So, if I plot I L 2, this is what I get. It is almost actually uh, kind of is plotted over I L 1. So, I L 1 and I L 2 practically have the same response. Okay. So, you see that different modes are seen to in, uh, uh, in different extents in the different states. In this particular uh, example, we could really interpret the presence of the complex eigenvalue pair, the faster and slower responses and also uh, in some ways interpret the eigenvector. In fact, uh, in an, this particular example, I have chosen specifically to illustrate a very, very important modeling approximation, which we will see in the next class. This particular system is in fact, what you call a stiff system, which has a combination of a slowly moving transient e raise to minus 0 0.1 t and a faster relatively faster oscillation, which also decays faster. So, uh, these kind of systems are called stiff systems and whenever you have stiff systems, we have, may have problems solving them numerically, we shall see later. Numerical integration may be a problem using uh, simple methods. But we also would be able to make some good and e modeling uh, simplifications. So, with that uh, we stop today's lecture. In the next lecture, I will introduce you to some very important modeling principle.